Oh, Father, as we now prepare to open your word, we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit. Draw us closer to you. May we hear your voice speaking to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, church. Joyce wanted me, my wife wanted me to tell you hello. She's at a women's ministry retreat today. So she left me by myself. So I don't know what I ate yesterday in her absence, but I was sick as a dog this morning. And I have not been able to keep anything down so far. So you pray for me that I don't fall out up here on the rostrum. The story is told about a man who was walking along a precipice. And he was enjoying nature and he slipped and slid down the precipice and was able to grab hold to the last branch of a tree before possibly falling to his death. As he hung there from both hands, he began to cry out, is anybody up there? Can anybody hear me? Finally, a voice from heaven called out and said, I am here, and I hear you. You have nothing to fear. Just let go, and I will catch you. There was a pregnant pause, and then the man said, is anybody else up there? <laughs> In our spiritual lives, is there anybody else? You know, what would it be like to live so close to God that he could remove, remove you from the earth and take you to heaven? How does anyone as weak and erring as we are prepare themselves for translation? What kind of life must we live to be at peace with Jesus and to see him and to be body snatched by God, which is really why we're here. We're not here just to hang out with one another. This isn't some spiritual club. Something in the process of why we come to worship and why we fellowship is to prepare us to meet Jesus in peace. Is there anybody else who we could call? So this morning, we want to look at the life of Enoch, a man whose life is somewhat shrouded in mystery. For someone who was the first human being to leave the planet, we know very little about Enoch. But we can derive from a few scriptures, of the paucity of scriptures in, script, in the Bible about his life, we can find some lessons that can teach us about the power of grace as we continue our series entitled Portraits of Grace. So we look at our main text, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, you can look on the screen. By the way, how many have your Bibles? Just raise that Bible up. Let me see it. All right. I see some phony Bibles out there. All right. There's a real, we got some real thing here. All right. Very good. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. These two passages of scripture are frequently separated, but they're actually one thought. It's a thought about what happened in Enoch's life and what must happen in our lives. If we exegete the passage for just a second, by faith, Enoch walked by faith, the same faith that you and I must have, the faith that is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It says that he was taken. Enoch was body snatched by God, personally escorted into heaven by Jesus himself. He had a testimony. His testimony is that he pleased God. 
But without faith, it says, it's impossible to please him. Because those who come to him must first of all believe that he is, that he is sovereign of their life, and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And indeed, this is perhaps the clue. The clue to how Enoch was so successful in walking with God. He was diligent. Now the word diligent in the Greek is exetio. It means to search out or to investigate, but it's one other meaning that I want us to focus on this morning. That word diligent also could be translated crave, crave. You see, Enoch craved God more than you crave a Krispy Kreme donut. I don't know about you, but every time I drive by Krispy Kreme, you wonder if it's the sign on that says the stuff is, some of y'all know what I'm talking about when they're fresh out of the oven and you know you can get a hot donut? Do you ever crave something? You know, I, I never met a donut I didn't, didn't appreciate. And I'm still trying to figure out where the hole came from. Who, who put the hole in it? But Enoch learned to crave, to crave God. His life depended on God, so he craved him as if that life was to be. He craved to love him and to know him. He was diligent in his walk. This kind of craving places God as the center of one's life, as the, the primary orientation, the focus, the life goal. God is not some fine suit of clothes that we wear just on Sabbath. He's not an occasional companion, a co-pilot, a road dog, piggy bank or some social concierge. God is not the flavor of the month, some passing fancy or the soup of the day. God is not a rainy day umbrella that we use just when we need him. He's not some insurance policy when things go wrong. Enoch craved the very presence of God in his life moment by moment for over 300 years. Now what's interesting when you read in Genesis the story of Enoch it says that Enoch was 65 when his first son was born, Methuselah. But then it says Enoch walked with God for 300 years. There's nothing like kids to drive you to Jesus. It never said he walked with God in the first 65 years. But after his son was born, it says he walked with God. Folk, if you got kids, you know what it is to walk with God. There are sometimes, there's a, I think a retribution that happens, you know, all the dirty stuff you did when you were a kid, then you have children and you watch yourself in your kids and you shake your head like, God, why? And God sits back and says, okay, you did that. Now it's your turn. Something about parenting changed Enoch. And he walked with God for 300 years. Now, some of us will probably only live to 70, 80, maybe 90. Can you imagine being faithful to God for 300 years? Yet he did. Now, it can easily be said that Enoch's connection and craving of God was so rare that in these modern times, we think it's almost impossible to do that. But we need to understand that Enoch did not have any kind of special gift or talent or ability that any one of us can't have. If I use the vernacular, Enoch was just a dude, a plain, ordinary man. But perhaps more than ordinary, he became extraordinary because of his walk with God. Speaking about him in Patriarchs and Prophets, we find these words, his mind, his heart, his conversation were in heaven. The greater the existing iniquity, the more earnest his longing for a home with God. The worse the world appeared, the more he wanted to be with God. But here's the kicker. Not only did Enoch walk with God, but God also walked with Enoch. His testimony was that he pleased God. God enjoyed hanging out with Enoch. He enjoyed his company. He led him in the paths of righteousness. 
Enoch craved closeness with God, and God responded by getting closer to him. But ladies and gentlemen, you can't crave closeness with God with unconfessed and unrenounced sin. And perhaps this is what's going on in our own lives. We, we're holding on to things. And that's why we don't get close to God. It's Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear you. Sin separates. It alienates. It drives us away from our master and from his loving arms because God is in search of us. It's almost like a great chase. God keeps chasing after us and we keep running away because this notion of craving God is foreign to us. I sometimes wonder, do we really want to be close to God? Are we concerned that somehow that closeness might jeopardize things important to us. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? So how can willful disobedience or even slothful neglect, desire to be close and intimate with ultimate perfection and holiness? And perhaps it is this conundrum that separates us from God and also separates us from Enoch. You see, we crave success, comfort, ease, security, and perhaps a little taste of sin on the side. And it's that little taste of sin that causes us trouble. So Satan has convinced us of the lie that we cannot live holy lives. So we don't desire holiness or purity. We just give up because we have bought into the lie that we can't live holy lives. We are content, therefore, to offer God mediocre sacrifices and just hope for the best. We have been seduced by the idea that holy people have no fun that they wear weird clothes and that they always have a frown on their face. I believe that we are afraid to be holy. Holiness means a change in what we have been. Holiness is scary. Holy people do strange things like stand up for God when it matters. We don't want to be holy, perhaps. Diligence, you see, is the opposite of unintentional living. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how God has called us to live intentionally. Diligence is the opposite of unintentional living. You see, Enoch was diligent. He was habitual. He was focused, curious about God, intrigued by spiritual things, infatuated, adoring, contrite, appreciative. Enoch was in love with God, and he hungered for the presence of the divine in his life. He left room for God to occupy his heart. Reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 87, it says, for three centuries, he had walked with God day by day. He had longed for a closer union. Nearing and nearer had grown their communion until God took him to himself. But in reality, no matter what we may think about Enoch, Enoch was just another sinner saved by grace. Don't get it twisted. There's only been one immaculate conception. Enoch was a man just like you and I are men and women today. He was, he was prone to every problem that we have. And in fact, it took him 65 years to get it right before he actually started walking with God. We need to understand 
that the testimony he had was that he pleased God. God was not pleased with his profession. He was not pleased with his tithe paying. He wasn't impressed with any of those kinds of things. He was, he was not even pleased that, that Enoch went to church. I doubt if Enoch was even vegan. And you can't imagine, you can't imagine how a non-vegan would ever be translated. But Hebrews 11.6 tells us without faith it is impossible to please him. It was Enoch's faith that pleased God. It was the faith that craved. You know, I'd ask, I thought I was going to bring a donut in the pulpit because I, I love dietary sermon illustrations. But I, I don't think I could keep it down, so I said maybe I won't, won't do that. But that kind of faith is not the natural, normal kind of it. It was a faith that said, I got to have God in my life. And he understood that before he could crave God, it was God who actually craved him. The Bible teaches us that we love him because he first loved us. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Enoch lived in a world, by the way, that was just before the flood. It was a world so wicked that God repented of even creating man. This is the world that he lived in, just as full of sin as, and temptation as our world, yet he was able to keep his heart with all diligence. The issues of our lives leap from our hearts. It is not what comes from the outside that, de that defiles a man. It's what grows inside of us that defiles us. Enoch diligently monitored his thoughts and his conversation, focusing his energies not on a set of propositions or doctrines, but on his connection to a God. He loved the law of God because he loved the law giver. He had a relationship with Jesus. If we fall in love with Jesus, then obeying him is just the natural outgrowth of our love relationship. It becomes an expression of our love. You see, when you love someone, you naturally want to spend as much time as you can with that person. We have a brand new married couple right here. They want to spend some time with each other because they love each other. Now, what they are in now is what we call the spring of love. Some of y'all are in the winter of love. I mean, you, you ain't looking to spend no time, you know, how much time do I have to spend with you today, sweetie? I mean, that, but it's that spring love that characterizes the Christian relationship to his God, to their God. It is a love that wants to be with Jesus. You know, this kind of craving means that as you go through your day, no matter where you work or what you do, you keep God at the center of your thinking. I find myself in my office, just whispering prayers to God, especially when I'm confronted with stupidity, with ignorance, with hard-headedness. And then you say, Lord, I, I really need you now because this person is about to get on my last nerve. That ever happened to anybody? Is it, I'm just the only one that has a last nerve? Oh, so, okay, so the nervous ones among us. We recognize that without God's power, without his presence in our lives, we couldn't go through the day. We have to crave him and want to be with him and stay in that relationship with him. I want to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, just turn there with me quickly. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, when I command you today, that I command you today, 
that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. God promises to overflow us, to overtake us. You cannot outrun God's favor. It overtakes you. But we have some additional blessings, some things that help us to live holy lives. I want you to know I believe that we can live holy. In fact, I believe that if we do not live holy, we're fooling ourselves. We find two additional blessings from Scripture. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to us. God's grace is provided in this unique gift in the ministry of the Spirit to prepare us to live holy lives and to get us ready to be snatched into glory. That's what the Holy Spirit is here to do. And we find in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 89, it says, but like Enoch, God's people will seek for purity of heart and conformity to his will until they shall reflect the likeness of Christ. When our visitors come in this church, I want them to be confused because they, they're going to think they saw Jesus all over the place. Because as we seek purity, we begin to resemble Christ and reflect him to others. Jeremiah 29, beginning at verse 12, says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. But there's more good news this morning. Not only can we live holy lives now if we choose to, but our text from Hebrews also tells us that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Enoch received his reward, and that reward was translation. And his reward is our reward. You see, there's a great body snatch day that's coming in our future. The faithful will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We serve a God who rewards us. If you look in that passage, the word rewarder comes from the Greek word mythopostatis, which means to recompense, to pay wages that are due. Now God makes recompense for our wages, for wages that we did not even earn. That's grace. It's unmerited favor because Jesus paid it all on the cross and rewards us with a crown that he deserves, not the hell that we deserve. With his stripes, Isaiah says, we are healed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Or for some of you, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. You'll catch that joke down on the 134. For he made him who knew no sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the whole concept of reward is but an act of grace. The same grace that Enoch had is ours this morning. As he pleased God, so may we. But God rewards me for what he has done in my life as if I did it. He took a cross so that in faith I can get a crown. Enoch craved a God who craved him even more and was rewarded for the object of his desire, eternal fellowship with his Lord. What do you want in your life? What do you crave? For many of us, it's not God. God is a convenient accessory. And we crave worldly things. 
until God is the one thing we want more than anything else, until he is the diligent focus of our lives, the all-consuming passion of our days, we are just fooling ourselves to think that something more for us will happen than being on this earth. It is the diligent walk of faith, this craving type of faith that will see us home. Because the just, the Bible says, shall live by faith. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't crave God any more than he already craves you. And that is the beauty of the relationship between God and his people. While we seek him even harder, he is trying to seek us. And he will reward us one day with the object of our desire, and that is himself. I remember when I got married, we were in Fresno, California. I think it was well over 100 degrees on September 1st, almost 44 years ago. The wedding was beautiful. The music was great. The reception had great cake. But I was looking forward to my honeymoon. I had a brand new car. I wanted to steal my bride away from that reception and let the honeymoon begin. Ladies and gentlemen, heaven is the honeymoon of the redeemed. That's where the bride and the bridegroom finally kiss. That's where they meet. That's where they abode together. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will receive you unto myself. He wants to snatch us into glory. And what he's looking for is a people who will crave him the way he craves us. What do you desire most? What is your treasure? Because Scripture teaches where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. If you can't give your heart to God, it's probably because he's not your treasure. Something has come between you and your creator. As I close, I just want you to imagine something with me. I want you to imagine what heaven was like when Jesus himself walked Enoch into the holy city. The first human being ever to leave this planet and go to heaven. There must have been a buzz. The angels must have been ecstatic. Everybody was trying to take a look at him and say, what kind of man is this that God himself takes him from the earth? He looked just like us. One day, if I remain faithful and you remain faithful, whether we call from the grave or standing on the ground, we will all be caught up to see Jesus in the air. By the way, why I use the term body snatch? Because God, this thing about salvation is a bodily process. If my old body down here is jacked up, which it is, the Bible says we are going to be changed, just corruptible, we'll put on incorruption. We're going to get a new body. My wife will have a birthday coming up soon, and I said if I, if I multiply her, her birth years by two, and she winds up being well over 100 at that point in time, you know, we'll all have stuff that we didn't have when we were born, right? Artificial limbs, hearing aids, artificial. By the time we get to that point, they'll be able to give us new eyes, a bunch of spare parts. God has a much better plan. He says, I'm just going to recreate you. So one day, when you find me in heaven, I'm going to have hair. <laughs> We're going to be looking good. And all the things that are broke down and tore up about us now, all that goes away. Here comes Jesus walking east, Enoch, through heaven. 
I just wish I could have been a fly on the wall, but they don't have flies in heaven. I just wish I could have been a bird in the sky to see what Enoch was thinking as he walked into heaven. And in my mind's eye, in my, in my preacherly imagination, I see Jesus leaving heaven, coming to earth, grabbing Enoch by the arm and saying, hey, I got something for you. And Enoch says, what's up? He says, let's take a, let's take a ride. And the next thing he knows, he's standing in glory. Now, Revelation says that it will probably take us about seven days to get from here to heaven. And I think it's because we got to get our act together. You know, we got to figure out how to wear our crowns so we don't like look stupid when we get there and, and make sure our robes are fitting right. We're going to talk to one another and he's going to be wiping away our tears. And then finally, the psalmist says, and, and you see it in, in prophecy, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come. And then the antiphonal choir begins to sing back, who is this king of glory? And then he answered back, the Lord, mighty in battle. And when he comes into the kingdom, he is bringing us along with him. I don't know about you. I, I want to be humble when I get to heaven, but I think I'm going to strut. <laughs> Anyone going to say, yeah, we bad? And we aren't. We will throw our crowns at his feet and recognize that were it not for the grace of God, none of us would be there. You see, Enoch needed the same grace that you and I need. And he took that grace and craved for more. So much that God could not be without him and took him to heaven because he pleased God. Enoch was saved before we even know about the cross. He was saved by a promissory note, an IOU, a blank check, because the price for Enoch's salvation had not yet been paid. But for you and me, we are saved by a bloody ransom, the blood of Jesus on the cross. We are redeemed by his blood. And that blood is a guarantee to Enoch and to us that we are craved more than we could ever imagine. So this morning, if I can get this on. This morning, I want to close with a question for you. What do you crave? What are you looking for? What do you want? What feeds you? See, I'm convinced we can make a decision this morning to walk out of this place determined to live holy lives, determined to be ready for translation. I was on Facebook this week and I was reading about a mother of one of my Facebook friends, she went to visit some family, had a good time with her family members, and died suddenly. When I was 19, I thought I was bulletproof. Nothing could faze me. I felt the same way through my 20s. There's something humbling about years. I'm now very allergic to bullets. <laughs> I recognize my mortality. For the young people in the audience, I know you don't think you'll ever get sick or ever die. But ladies and gentlemen, we are only one breath away from eternity. And the only question that remains, what kind of eternity? We can be either eternally with the one we love, Jesus, or eternally extinct.
So there are two resurrections that the Bible talks about. The resurrection of the righteous, and then a thousand years later, the resurrection of the wicked. You don't want to oversleep. I want the eternal alarm clock to go off on time. Now the one thing you should take heart in, everybody is going to see Jesus. The only issue is when. Either you see him on the, on the resurrection morning where he's pulling his people to him, or you see him on that day that the wicked are about to receive their punishment. With all you know and all you've learned, how would you feel if you come up in the wrong resurrection? See, there are people who don't know anything about what you know. But you know what God has called us to. I am convinced that holiness is within our grasp. If Enoch could do it, so can you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, as we look to you now, Give us faith, the faith that craves you, the faith that transforms us. May we understand that you have called us to something more than what we have so far aspired to. We have been lied to to believe that we can't live holy lives now. But with all the gifts you've given us, your word, your spirit, your presence, you call us into holiness. You call us into relationship. Lord, may the sins in our lives be renounced this morning. May nothing come between our souls and our Savior. While everyone is praying, every head is bowed, there may be somebody here who recognizes that you've been brought here today for a specific purpose by heaven. That you've allowed stuff to come between you and God. And you want to make it right. You want to start on that pathway that leads to full fellowship with God. You want your sins forgiven. You want to rededicate yourself to a, a kind of service that you've never participated in before, a kind of devotion that would be pleasing to God. If that's your desire, just, just raise your hand with me. Say, Lord, I want you to accept my life. Accept me where I am, but don't leave me where I am. Take me where you would have me to be. God bless you. Lord, you see these hands. We commit ourselves to your care to your grace. This has nothing to do with our works. It is what you do in us. And we pray, Lord, that we would just be willing. Willing to be made willing. And that you would perform your miracle of grace. Just as you did for Enoch. In our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray, let the church say, Amen.